What's up, guys? Hey, it's Clint Coons here. And in this episode, what I want to go through is syndications. I mean, I talk to people all the time and I get uh, phone, uh, not phone calls, but emails from individuals. People actually put the comments in the channel. They want to know about how they go out and raise money or how do I partner with someone else? Now, this is an area of the law that if you're out there and you're trying to take down larger deals and, and you're looking at ways to use other people's money, be, bring people into your deals, you got to be careful because the last thing you want to be doing is wearing an orange jumpsuit because you screwed this up. And there are no second chances when it comes to joint venturing with other people if it borders on syndication. So what I wanted to do is bring on an individual I've known for many years who's worked with a lot of my clients when it comes to creating syndication. So you can go out there and take down those multifamily deals, a pool of properties, or maybe just one big, huge house. Whatever it is, this person is an expert in her field, and she is going to talk to you today about how to set up these types of things and the things you need to look out for. Uh, her name is Kim Lisa Taylor. She's here from Syndication Attorneys, PLLC. Kim, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for inviting me, Clint. Oh, thanks for coming on. You know, this is a topic that there's a lot of confusion about it. Everyone seems to have an opinion and I don't really have an opinion. I just know that I'm not going to talk about it because it's not my space. I don't operate in this lane, but I do know this. I don't want to be sharing a bunk with someone in federal prison because I got it wrong. So, so good to have you here. And just to start off, all right, how about we just start, you know, joint venture, you hear me talking about that. I brought out syndication. I'm sure you get this all the time. What's really the difference? Well, so the difference lies in whether or not you're selling securities. And the way to determine whether you're selling securities is, is in a joint venture, all of the members have to have an active role in generating their own profits. In a syndicate, you have passive investors that are relying on the promoter of the deal to generate the profits for them. And when you get into the second situation and these passive investors are relying on you to generate the profit, you've, you're selling something called an investment contract. And investment contracts are securities. So the Securities Act of 1933 created this whole big long definition of what constitutes securities. And the one that usually pertains to real estate investors is the one called an investment contract. So if you're selling interest in a company to passive investors, you're running the show or you and your management team are out there finding the deals, conducting the due diligence, overseeing the, the deal on behalf of investors, and the investors are just putting in their money and waiting for you to send them checks, then you're selling investment contracts, you're selling securities. And then now that means that you need more than just an LLC operating agreement. You need to have some disclosure documents and maybe some filings with the SEC. There's some specific rules you have to follow. Okay. So I want to break this down here because it, it, it is confusing and people always ask these questions. So let's assume that I'm going to set up a, a limited liability company and I have three family members um, that want to invest with me, but I'm going to run it because I have the knowledge and the expertise. I'm going to go out there. We're going to maybe purchase a mobile home park, maybe something even smaller. And so they come in and it's a manager managed LLC and I'm the manager. Would that be an issue? Um, probably. So when you're forming an LLC, you have an opportunity to form it as a member managed LLC in which all of the members are considered to be managing members and each of them have the right to contractually bind the company, to open and close bank accounts, to make their own decisions regarding the investment. So that's typically the structure you would use for a joint venture. That would be a member managed LLC. The other option that you have when forming an LLC is form it as a manager managed LLC, where the manager is the only one that has the opportunity and the ability and the authority to make all of the day to day decisions and uh, certain major decisions on behalf of the group. There might be some certain decisions that are reserved for membership to vote on, but that's not enough to take it out of the realm of securities. They actually have to be more in that member managed uh, LLC scenario where they are actually managing members and in control of their own investments. So if I brought in my family, say I brought in my mother-in-law and my brother and my sister-in-law and maybe a cousin, 
and I was the manager, that could cross the line into being a considered a security because I'm controlling everything. They just sit back and collect money. That's exactly right. So you sold them an investment contract and that's the trigger for having to comply with securities laws. Doesn't matter how many people, it's whether or not you have passive investors. I guess, you know, so this is the thing. Everything is fine. People always say to me, well, Clint, I've been doing this for years and it's never been an issue. Of course not, right? Until your mother-in-law gets upset with you or your sister-in-law gets upset with you because you got drunk one night at Christmas time and you made some inappropriate comments. That's when you could probably get in trouble, I imagine, when they Well, or what, what, what really happens is uh, somebody gets sick and they want their money back. Uh, somebody dies and you're no longer dealing with that original investor that you knew very well. Now you're dealing with their heirs. Their heirs look at you as, hey, you've got $100,000 of my mom's money and we want it. And they don't care what's going on with the deal. They didn't sign up for the deal. They just want the money. And when you say, I can't give it back because it's tied up in this deal, we're going to own it for another three to five years. They're like, no way. They go to a, an attorney who starts putting pressure on you. And then the whole thing starts to unravel because that attorney, if they have any knowledge of corporate securities law, is going to start finding out how you structured this deal, whether or not you provided the appropriate disclosures, whether you followed the right securities laws, made sure that the people had the right uh, financial qualifications and all of that. And if they can find that you violated securities laws, there is no limited liability for you. Okay. What's this term <laughs> people throw around friends and family exemption? I, I've heard it you know, a few times. So there is a friends and family exemption. It's called Regulation D Rule 506. It's That's the federal exemption. Uh, each state has its own securities agency. So there's you know 50 mini SECs running around there that each have their own set of rules. But most people follow the federal rule because it preempts all these individual state laws. So if you're raising money from people in multiple states or the properties in a state where you don't live, you're crossing state lines, then everybody follows the, the federal law. The federal rules, there's one that most everybody uses called Regulation D Rule 506. And the one that you use for your friends and family is called Reg D Rule 506B. And that, that exemption allows you to raise an unlimited amount of money from an unlimited number of, in, of accredited investors and up to 35 non-accredited but sophisticated investors but you can't find them through any means of general advertising and solicitation. And the way to prove that you didn't advertise for them is to be able to demonstrate that you had a pre-existing substantive relationship with that person prior to asking them to invest with you. Substantive means you already knew enough about that person to understand their financial qualifications. You already knew whether they were accredited or not accredited. And if they're not accredited, how are they sophisticated? Are they interested in being in a deal as long as the one you're proposing, whether or not this is a good fit for them? So okay. you don't have to have had that conversation and documented it before you even tell them about a deal. So under that rule that you just brought up, um, if I, again, going back to my, my, my family members that I laid out there, I've already know about their situation and I bring them in and I say, well, it's qualified under this exemption. Do I have to file anything or can I just, you know, set up the LLC? And if I ever get challenged, I would hire you and you would cite out this 506 D whatever it was you said, and that would cover me. So you have to have documented how you followed the exemption. There is a filing. It's not 100% required, but if you do the filing, then it is considered a safe harbor because it's presumed that you, you knew about the rule and you followed the rule if you file what's called a Form D with the Securities and Exchange Commission. And then the states also want to have a copy of that. So they want to know that you did file the appropriate paperwork, this Form D with the SEC, and then they want to see a copy of it, but they also want to have the notice filing fee that comes along with that. That's what they're really interested in. So you also have to file notices with the state securities agencies where your investors claim residency. And there's 15 day filing deadlines on these filings. So within 15 days of when an investor's funds become irrevocably contractually committed, you are obligated to make this filing and to, to have that filing in with the appropriate securities agencies. Interesting. So so you brought up something that, you know, I was just joking around about your mother-in-law or sister-in-law getting upset with you. But the way I would see this really playing out is if I brought people in, my family members, and one of them's going through a divorce, the spouse 
could use this to apply pressure to your sibling or your close family member for settlement purposes. Because I, I mean, that's what I would do. I would say, listen, if you don't meet some of my demands, I'm going to report your brother to the Securities and Exchange Commission because I don't think he set it up the right way, he didn't follow securities rules, and I'm going to try to bring pressure to bear on him and get an investigation started. And I could see, you know, hopefully my brother would say, oh, yeah, I don't want that, and uh, maybe boost the check that he's been asked to cut. And that would all fall back on me because I looked at them as family members, not thinking that down the road there could be these situations where somebody gets a divorce or somebody receives the money in the inheritance and they're not happy about it. And so they try to come back on you. Interesting. So the manager idea, let's say I made them all managers, but really I'm the one in control. So I'm going to- yeah, it's, not, it's not what you say, it's what you do. That's uh -huh. going to determine. Well, a former SEC commissioner was asked one time, how many times when you're asked if something is a security, does it turn out to be a security? And he said, 95% of the time. Interesting. Yeah. And I've heard this. And I'd like you, you could confirm it. So one of the ways in which people have tried to get around this is they try to they, they attempt to structure the money coming in, not as equity, but as debt. So they'll work with 10 different lenders that are all unsecured, loan money to the LLC, use those funds. They'll say, listen, I have no investors now. All I have are lenders, all unsecured lenders. Well, if you read the definition of securities in the 1933 Securities Act, the very first thing on the list are notes. Ah, see. So yeah, notes are securities it. too. And so, you know, if you're borrowing money from a family member, it's a one-off deal or, uh, you know, the nobody cares, right? It's an isolated mm -hmm. transaction. Or if you're only borrowing from one accredited investor that you know very well, something like that, nobody's going to care about it. But if you're in a business that, that depends on repeatedly borrowing money, from what the SEC calls retail investors. So those are you know, people that you know, your friends, your family, your acquaintances. If you're in that business and you're repeatedly borrowing money, you are in the business of uh, selling notes as securities and you still have to follow securities laws. Okay, so, so then what I've heard is this, hey, if you, if you got the relationship with close family members, maybe you could get by without having to file anything, but if you're gonna be bringing in other people, you definitely need to do something here to make sure that you're setting it up the right way. And of course, that's where you come in as an attorney. You, you draft these things all the time. So for, for somebody who is contemplating this, you know, they'll come to us and we'll have us set up LLCs. And I tell them, you cannot use this operating agreement to this LLC that I've set up for this deal. Uh, when should they consider getting that, that you know, contacting you, getting that... Um, syndication going, that operating agreement, and all of that, you know, after they found the property before, what do you recommend? Well, we recommend that you have a deal under contract. You have a signed purchase agreement because until then you're just having a conversation, right? Mm -hmm. And it, so we usually recommend three things. You get a deal under contract, you review the financials to make sure that it still is a deal. And someone from your team physically visits the site, runs through, drives through the neighborhood, figures out whether or not this is even something you want to own. And once you've done those three things, based on our experience, my own personal experience with syndicating properties, and uh, the experiences of all my clients, by the time you've done those three things, you're 90 to 95 percent likely to close. Anything else you might find during your due diligence is just going to be a deal negotiation point, not necessarily deal killer. So once you're 95% certain you're going to close, get us involved because there's a time period that we need in order to generate these documents for you. So we are typically generating 140 to 180 pages of legal documents and you have to review them. And we end up going back and forth a couple of times on the drafts until we get them the way that you want them and 100% correct. And then you're ready to start raising money. So that whole process can take two or three weeks. So we, okay, you brought up a really good point there at the end about raising the money. Now, if, if I'm making that transition from, say, single family into multifamily, and, I, and I'm going to bring in some investors to work with me, it just seems logical that I would first start talking to people just to get a sense if, if I have people that would be interested in going in on a deal with me like this. Um, is that a problem? Well, as long as you're not talking about specific deals, number one, you don't want to talk about a deal until you have a purchase agreement, because if you do, I've seen many, many times where you talk to the wrong person and they go steal the deal. And you have a purchase agreement, you got nothing. 
right? They go, they figure out what you offered and they offer $50,000 more and then they have the deal you don't. So um, you have to be cautious about what you say. You can always advertise your company. You can talk in generalities. You know, I'm in the business of um, syndicating multifamily property, or I put small groups of investors together and we buy properties. You know, if that's something you're interested in, let's have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. There's going to be some questions I have to ask you, some things I need to know about you to make sure you're suitable to be in these kinds of deals. And then I'd be able to tell you about some future deals. So it's everybody you meet today, you're talking about future deals. You shouldn't be meeting people today and talking about a deal that you're raising money for right now. Unless you have your docs in place, correct? Unless you've already had, well, so, so that what I said was you shouldn't be meeting someone today. Yeah. Planning, right. And talking to them about a deal that you have today, because you really need to have that conversation with them about their suitability and document that you had the conversation and you understand their financial qualifications, whether they're suitable to be in your deal before you start telling them about deals. So once you've done that, it's not, you know, there used to be people that would say, oh, it's a three touch rule and oh, you have to have three touches in 45 days. You know, that that's that's just kind of, you know, somebody's idea of, hey, this would probably be defensible. And they, they're probably right. Um, but what the SEC really said is that, no, you have to have this conversation with them and document the conversation about their suitability be in your deals. Once you have that information, then you have the right quality of relationship to be able to offer them investment opportunities. So it's not about the duration of time. It's how long you, well, how, how much you know about that person. Got it. All right. So if I find the deal and then after I got this deal and it's under contract and I'm in, you know, past that feasibility, I know I want to close on it, then I would contact you and you would help me then prepare the documents that I could then take and go out to my investors on and say, all right, here's the deal. Here's the offer. Here's what I'm looking to bring in. They would read it and then they can make a determination uh, if they wanted to invest and, and then I could run it and everything would be good. That's exactly right. So we would set up your companies. We would draft operating agreements. There's usually going to be at least two companies, sometimes more, mm -hmm. in a syndicate. So you're always going to have an investor level LLC that's going to be manager managed. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to have your management level LLC. That could be a joint venture. That could be member managed. It might be manager managed. I mean, let's say if uh, only one or two people were signing on the loan, but you had four other members of your management team, then you would make it manager managed with those loan guarantors as the managers. Yep. So we, we have some discussions with you about all of that to determine what's the appropriate structure and what's going to pass muster with the lender. Right. So the, we are always thinking about what's going to be acceptable to the lender. And we're creating a, the, the organization chart that we know that they will they will accept. Um, so then the other thing that we're going to do is draft the uh, securities compliance documents. So that's uh, usually going to be a private placement memorandum. Uh, that's going to describe all the risks of the investment. And there's about seven pages in there that talks about all the different things that could go wrong and then a subscription agreement. And so this is where the investor tells you about themselves. So this is where they certify to you that they read the private placement memorandum. They understand the risks. They can afford to take the risks. And they're, then here's how much they're going to invest. So with those two documents, the private placement memorandum, the subscription agreement, your investors have assumed the risk of that investment. So you're not on the hook now if all of a sudden, you know, an earthquake happens and the place collapses or a hurricane comes through and blows it down or wind damages a building and it doesn't, you can't, you can't rent it out anymore. So you're not responsible for that or for any losses that are generated from any of those risks that you warned them about. Okay. So you, you said something there and, I, and you and I are so in alignment on this, that when it comes to investing, that, that lending portion, that's what I always refer to as the business planning side of it. You got to make sure what you're doing is going to work with the lenders. Otherwise, you're not going to get their money. So if I'm out there and I know that on this deal, it's not going to be me. I'm not going to go on the loan. My, my, my credit has been hit because I've been too many doing too many other deals and I want to bring someone else in for the lender. That person then that I bring in is going to have to go on the management arm is what I'm hearing. Yeah, that's what has been our experience. I think one time there was a you know local community bank that said, no, they can just be a member and they didn't care. But almost if you're dealing with any Fannie or uh, Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac lender uh, or you 
know, CMBS loans, they're always going to require that the people who are guaranteeing that loan, even for non-recourse loans, they're still guarantors, that yep. they're going to be the, in ultimate control of that deal. So if it starts to go down in flames, they're the ones that's dealing with a bank and trying to salvage the investment. So when you say it's a non-recourse loan, how could they still be a guarantor? <laughs> Well, because there's things called carve outs and these carve outs are for anything illegal that happens at the property that causes the loss. So, you know, you allow somebody to have a meth lab in there and they blow the place up. Well, you know, then you're on the hook yeah. or, uh, you know, you, you're, you rent it as a, you know, the prostitution ring or something. I mean, I've been to, I used to be a HUD housing inspector and I've been to some really scary <laughs> places know. that I wouldn't even go there without a police escort. Yeah. <laughs> so, so there are some scary places out there, but uh, yeah. You, so there's bad boy car routes. Mm -hmm. uh, that hold the guarantors responsible for losses that the lender incurs because of illegal acts. And there's also environmental indemnification. So if some later discovered environmental issue is uh, discovered and then and the uh, responsibility for that isn't placed on the current owner, then uh, the lender is going to hold any deficiencies. Uh, they're going to hold the guarantors responsible for those deficiencies. That one is very small risk because mm -hmm. most commercial lenders are not going to allow you to take to to buy a property until someone has done an environmental site assessment and that environmental site assessment is going to identify any of those potential problems and if you've done that kind of due diligence prior to taking a uh, title to the property then even in the eyes of the uh, you know federal government the EPA and your state uh, state uh, environmental agencies you would not be held responsible for that if you did the due diligence and then it was later discovered Okay, so when, you, when you're talking about that management arm, then what type of entity is that typically going to be? Still going to be an LLC, typically. Uh, could be a corporation. Uh, most of the times it's an LLC, but if, uh, you know, some tax advisors suggest that it should be a corporation for one reason or another, then, uh, you know, we'll defer to that. Uh, but for the most part, it's, it's usually going to be an LLC and comprised of, and I always say, don't do a joint venture with more than five people. Because every time there's been more than five people in the management of a syndicate or of a deal where there's a member managed LLC, things go wrong. Uh, six people apparently can't agree, but five people can. I've seen you know, managers of syndicates that ended up in litigation immediately after closing on the property. And uh, you know, it's just it's, there's there comes a point where there's just too many people and it becomes unwieldy. Yeah, and you know, just to share something on my side, when we put together the last deal that we did. Um, the way we, we got around dealing with the lender, again, we were using Corvest in the steel and they would, because my partner and I are 50-50, they wanted us both to be a guarantor and to qualify for the deal. So what we did is we created, structured the operating agreement. So I was a springing member that okay. my LLC interest didn't come into existence until after we'd closed on the loan. And that worked for the lender. So then they just took my partner's uh, information down. He was a guarantor in that deal. And then I didn't have to go on it or go through any of the financials. He did it all. Have you seen that before? I haven't seen someone use the springing member for that purpose, mm -hmm. um, but it, it's interesting. The way that we would typically structure that is we would have created a, a manager managed LLC for the two of you and just let him be the manager. Because if you create a manager managed LLC with him as the manager, they don't care who has the percentage interest. If it's a member managed LLC, then anybody with 20% or more of the interest has to be underwritten. And they want the guarantor to always have the majority interest. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen that too. Wow. There's just so much there when it comes to putting this stuff together. That's why you need someone like yourself who's knowledgeable. So when you're doing this and you're putting these things together, what are some of the, I would say, common mistakes that you've seen during your practice that people make? So we just uh, had some people that we were helping out not too long ago, and they came to us with documents that they drafted. And, uh, you know, they said, well, you know, will you just review these documents? And, uh, and a lot of times we will, um, sometimes we won't, but uh, when we do, we're looking for things like, do you have the right securities exemption? Um, do you have the right financial qualification 
uh, requirements for your investors that match the securities exemption that you selected? Do you have the appropriate disclosure documents? And do your documents all say, you know, are they consistent throughout? Are there inconsistencies? So those are the kinds of things we're always looking for. And, uh, you know, in the, in the case that uh, we just recently had, someone had taken a set of documents for a Reg D Rule 506C offering, which is an offering that can be advertised to but the only people that can be admitted are verified accredited investors, but they wanted to do a 506B offering. So, you know, it was inappropriate. The investors didn't need to be verified. We had to, you know, reconfigure all of that. And uh, so we, you know, it, it was so inconsistent that we just ended up starting over. Yeah, because many times I tell people, if you want me to do this type of work, it's going to end up costing you more than if you just let me start from scratch because That's I have right. to invest so much time in, in balancing it out. So mm -hmm. with the docs, one of the things that I, I tell people, and they, if they, you know, they watch my channel, uh, I discuss this, that the, your documents that you put together are really important. I mean, people think they can get by with a 10-page LLC operating agreement. They pull them off Legal Doom or, or Zoom, I mean, and, and they download <laughs> them and they, they fill them out. And I said, you know, it all works until someone's going to request a copy of those documents. And, and that's where things start to fall apart because if you're getting a loan, and I, and I would assume, correct me if I'm wrong here, that when you apply for, for a loan, it's a Freddie Fannie loan or, or, or the CMB, commercial mortgage-backed security is what we're referring to there. We, they have their own legal department. So they're going to ask for copies of that syndication, everything you just described. Is that correct? That's right. That's right. And they're going to review the manager's operating agreement, the investor level operating agreement. Sometimes you'll even have to have a separate title holding entity. They're going to look at all of that stuff because they want to know who the borrower is and how they're structured and who the ultimate investors are. In fact, they will even look at your investor level LLC to see who has over a certain percentage ownership in that company. And uh, every lender is going to have a threshold and they're going to say, you know, for Fannie, it's 20% of the total interest in your company. For Freddie, it's 25. For CMBS, I've seen it as low as 10. And whenever you, and a single investor exceeds that threshold, they want to underwrite them. And that's part of their requirements under the Banking Secrecy Act. So you've got to, you need to alert your investors that, hey, if you buy over X percent of this company, then you're going to have to be underwritten. And if it's if it's too much, then you may have to even have to help guarantee the loan. Okay, so so I've heard that before, and when I've talked to people, uh, I've told them, all right, you don't want to go in with, let's say, it's a Freddie Fannie product. Mm -hmm. You're not going to go in at over 20%. What you should do is set up different entities to hold your interest so that not one specific entity shows up as owning 20% or greater. Any experience in that? Orange jumpsuits? <laughs> Loan fraud, um, a couple of terms come to mind. Um, I don't know. So who, who does that I, fall on though? Who does that fall well, on? Well, it's going to fall on, ultimately, it's going to fall on the managers of that syndicate, Correct. especially right. if, they, if they had actual knowledge, right? Yeah. You know, I mean, if somebody comes to you and says, you know, hey, my brother-in-law is going to invest through this LLC, I'm going to invest through that LLC, you didn't have actual knowledge, you, maybe you can argue, you know, and somehow defend yourself. But, uh, you know, if you're advising someone, hey, just split it up into two LLCs, you know, the, the lenders can look through those LLCs if sure, they want. Sure. And, uh, you know, they, they, they may not want to until your loan fails, and then they may look very closely. So as a manager, if you're setting one of these things up, you never tell that to anyone. You let guys like me explain how that works for them. <laughs> so you yeah. have plausible deniability. That's right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Hide behind the attorneys. You know, uh, there, there's just so much here when it, when it comes to setting these things up. And we didn't go into, you know, advertising and all of that, because what I really wanted to convey to people is the importance of knowing when you need to set up the proper docs and don't try to wing it. Um, you brought up lending. And, and right now, with putting these deals together, what are you seeing out there? Where, where is the money coming from? Um, is it Freddie Fannie? Are they still lending a lot in this space or is it the other? Well, for multifamily, it's always been um, Fannie and Freddie. Mm -hmm. And for other types of properties, it's, it's usually CMBS loans. For smaller properties, I've seen community banks uh, do the deals for development projects. Community banks like to do the deals. 
So it just depends on the nature of your project and what it is you're buying and whether or not it fits their criteria. So I don't need to, as someone who's contemplating starting this, go out there and try to develop relationships with lenders ahead of time, since they're typically going to be asset-based, experience-based loans anyways. Is that a fair statement? Or yeah, usually, I... it, usually you're going to work with a mortgage broker. And mm -hmm. so there's you know a variety of very experienced commercial. You always want a commercial mortgage broker to help you because they're going to know who has what criteria and whether your loan is going to meet their, their criteria. So they're only going to submit it to lenders that they think are going to be interested. And so you don't want to have to submit loan applications and there's fees associated with that to lenders that aren't suitable for your deal. And the other thing to realize is that if you're doing Fannie and Freddie loans, um, and usually even some CMBS loans, uh, you can usually get these non-recourse loans. But if you start dealing with your community banks and lender, you know, your local lenders, uh, they're probably always going to require personal guarantees. And in my experience, the people that uh, had to declare bankruptcy after the Great Recession were the people that uh, signed all these personal guaranteed loans. Yeah, they got hurt. So- yeah. When it, if I were to, to reach out to you and, and to talk, you know, the waterfall provisions, who's going to get paid, how they get paid, I hear those questions all the time, the tax uh, ramifications of setting it up. Uh, is that something that I take it you guys would go through with, with an individual investor who's considering going down this road? Yeah, so um, if, when somebody becomes a syndication client, we spend about two hours with them going through all these different questions and scenarios and how they're going to set up their manager, who's going to guarantee loans, and you know, even so far as you know, what are you going to use for your company names and what kind of naming conventions are you going to use, not just for this syndicate, but for the other 20 that you want to do, you know, making sure that you're kind of creating a, a system for yourself that isn't going to make you go insane. Um, so we, we, it will help you figure out how to split money fairly with investors. You know, there's times when we tell our clients, you're offering your investors too much because uh, too much, uh, it, uh, breeds disbelief. So then people won't invest because they don't believe it. And, yeah. uh, and then also you kind of ruin your investors because then they never want to invest with you again until you got a deal just like the last one. And that was, you know, one in a million deal. So you have to be careful about what you offer, making sure it's fair for you, fair for them. And uh, you know, if your investors are concerned about what you're making, you really need to deflect that uh, that conversation back on them. It's like you know, it's about what you're making. What are you making now on your investments? You know, what what might you make here? And uh, you need to decide if it's suitable for you. And yes, I'm going to make a lot of money, but I've spent a lot of time and effort learning how to do this, and that's why I'm able to offer it to you. And in doing that, you'd probably walk the investor through where to set up the structure, because I know a lot of people, they, they want to go out and just file their, just, you know, get the entity registered in, say, Texas or Florida, where they think they're going to be buying. But would there be circumstances where you'd want to set it up in Delaware beforehand and you can't use that Florida one to close in it because lenders are something you're going to require it be registered in a different state initially or organized. Well, typically, if the loan balance is less than $10 million, uh, we typically suggest you use the state where the property is located. Mm -hmm. but the, uh, because if you form it in a different state, then you still have to register it in the state where the property is located so it can do business there. And uh, if the loan balance is $10 million or above, that's where you need that third title holding entity because the, the lenders want a, a bankruptcy remote entity that's one step removed from your investors as the title holding entity and the borrower on that loan. And they want that formed in Delaware. They're gonna have you hire a Delaware attorney to, to write an opinion letter that this loan is enforceable they, you know, against this Delaware company. And then you'll take that Delaware company and you'll register it where that property is located. Then you'll have an investor entity that owns that title holding entity. And then you'll still have your management entity for all of that. So it can get kind of complicated. Um, yeah. Even more complicated if you're bringing private equity. <laughs> It's just, this is why they need you to put this stuff together. So if people wanted to reach out to you, you know, they're, they're thinking about doing this, um, how best to go about connecting with you? So um, we have a great way that you can schedule an appointment with one of our staff at our website at syndicationattorneys.com. Uh, you can also download a free copy of my book, How to Legally Raise Private Money. You can get a free digital copy, copy there. Uh, so go to the syndicationattorneys.com website, click the tab, get the book, 
and uh, and you'll have it. And, or you can buy it on Amazon. Great. I'll put that in the show notes. So if anybody, when they're watching and they just want to get there immediately, they didn't want to have to write this down, don't worry. You get, grab it in the show notes, just click on it. I'll hyperlink you to take you there. You know, just definitely reach out to Kim if this is something you want to do, because as we said, we don't want to see you in an orange jumpsuit or use you as a future story of how someone did it wrong. Any parting comments? Um, thanks a lot for having me today. I hope the information was helpful and it's, uh, it's been a lively conversation. Likewise, thanks for coming on, Kim, and sharing all this valuable information with the viewers. Take care. Thanks, Clint.